Hey humans, how's it going? Susan Ruth here. Thanks for listening to another episode of Hey Human Podcast. This is episode 281, and I had a conversation with Andrea James. She's one of my bestest friends, and I was fortunate enough to talk her into coming over and having a convo with me. We've had so many incredible conversations on road trips and at functions and over breakfasts and and snacks and cocktails and all sorts of things and I mean I adore her her brain is boundless and um, she was born curious as I was so the minute I met her I knew I had found a kindred uh, they always say too that you should try and be in rooms with people smarter than yourself and Anytime I'm in the room with Andrea, I definitely feel like I'm in the room with somebody far smarter than me, and I love it because uh, it creates an atmosphere with great brain gymnastics, and you get to explore all sorts of worlds and ideas, and anyway, that's that's Andrea, for me at least, she's quite a gift in my life, and so I'm excited for you to hear about her and her life and her life's work and all things about her, plus we get to do it in person, which in this day and age is always a treat, so <laughs> I'm looking forward to you hearing about Andrea. All right. In other news, a couple things just uh, right off the bat. On October 16th in Washington State, in Carnation, Washington, I have a music show. I'll be performing with other artists, songwriters at a place called Miller's Gathering, and I'm excited for that. On October 13th at 8 p.m., I will be performing with my brother, Jeremy, doing improv at a place called the Unexpected Productions uh, in Post Alley in Seattle, Washington, and it's for the Duos of Comedy show, so that's going to be exciting. And then on the 17th of October at 7 p.m., Jeremy asked me to join his troupe, the Duval Improv Social Club, which will be done at the Main Street Mercantile in Duval, Washington. So if you are anywhere around those places, Carnation, Washington, Duval, Washington, or Seattle, Washington, come see us. And I would love to say hi. So please come up and say hi. Okay, usual stuff. Hey Human Podcast on social media under Facebook and Instagram. My personal social media, Susan Ruthism, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can find heyhumanpodcast.com. And on there, there will be a links page. Every episode, every guest has a links pile on the links page. And I have curated that especially for you so that you don't have to try and figure out all the different places that the information we talk about on the show is located. It's all in one place and you can do your deep dives that way. So definitely check that out. You can email me, Susan, at heyhumanpodcast.com. You can check out susanruth.com if you want to see people interviewing me or want to know more about my music or my artwork or uh, as I move into the realms of acting and things. Uh, that's definitely the place to find that information and you can join the mailing list which is right there on susanroot.com you can sign up on the mailing list rate and review hey human on itunes or wherever you get your podcasts super helpful and i appreciate it and i think that's about it be well stay safe thank you for listening treat each other with kindness we're all going through something am i right and uh, I love you. Thanks for listening. Here we go. Andrea James, welcome to Hey Human. Well, thank you for having me on. I'm so excited. We've been talking about this forever, so it's nice to finally do it. I know. It's, it is nice to finally do it. Um, you and I met uh, World of Wonder. Was it a Christmas? I keep wanting to say it's a Christmas party, and I know that's not right because there were, it wasn't about Christmas. I don't I, know why. I think it was an art opening of some sort. Was it but... around Christmas? And so my brain is just meshing... That could be. Uh, was Santa there? <laughs> I don't think Santa was there. I would remember that. Yeah. But all of their events kind of blur for me because I would go, yeah. you know, at least once a week. Oh, gosh. Dur before the, before the before pandemic. Before so, yeah. Wow, they had stuff that often. That's yeah. awesome. Bunch of festive people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I got a great picture with, uh, is it Trixie LaRue? Uh, Trixie Mattel? That's what I meant. Is there a LaRue... There's Chi Chi LaRue. I'm who confused. Is... Yeah, I just confuse everything. <laughs> <laughs> Who's also a great porn director. 
Really? Mm-hmm. Oh, would I know any of the shows? Uh, it's uh, it's gay porn, so I don't know if you're oh. a connoisseur. No. A lot, surprisingly, a lot of women are yeah. connoisseurs of gay porn. Yeah, well, I mean, I understand that. Uh, I interviewed a gay porn star once. Uh-huh. It's a great interview. Yeah, but no, I don't think I, I, I don't think I am fully versed in the gay porn oeuvre, if you will. Anyway, we met there and uh, definitely hit it off, but we didn't really get to connect until somewhere mid pandemic. I blame you because you were a, a starter on that, which was great. Yes, uh, we we. I thought I would see you again yeah. very quickly, and then the pandemic happened, and nothing was going on. And I was like, you know what? We should do. We should be pandemic pals. And yeah, I think we started Instagram pals first, right? Yeah, yeah. and then we started doing uh, Zoom calls. Yeah, those were fun. Yeah, yeah, cocktail Zoom. <laughs> And now here we are in real life. I know. It's nice to be face-to-face doing this with you. I know. Uh, I, think it, I think podcasts are always better face-to-face. I agree. And actually, since, just for the audience, uh, we've had some great adventures in the last few months. That's, well, six months, a year, I guess. I don't know. What five, time has no meaning, Andrea. <laughs> I don't know anything anymore. <laughs> but I've had some really fun adventures with you, so that's... Yeah. It's been, it's been a great friendship yeah. and... Uh, I think what I like about it is that we have so many overlapping interests, so I'm excited to chat with you today about whatever comes to mind. I know. I usually like to start at the part with, tell me about your childhood, but really quickly I want to touch base on the fact that you just had a huge honor bestowed upon you. Can we say what that is, or is that secret? Oh, yeah, you can say whatever you'd like. Okay, well, tell us what you've won. (laughs) The Library of Congress contacted me uh, to archive my life's work um, as part of their uh, their push to cover historically significant work uh, for the LGBT community. So be part of that specialized collection. It's did you just your brains fly out the top of your head? That's such an honor. Yeah, I was I was very pleased because um, it's sort of interesting, you know, I've been doing activism for 25 years and it's pretty much a thankless job. So, (laughs) so um, you don't do it because of the recognition. So when you do get it, that's always a lovely thing to have happen. Yeah. All right. Let's now go back in time. You are a kid growing up in Indiana. That's right. What was childhood like? So, I was born in Wisconsin, and then we moved around quite a bit. Um, We had a farm in Illinois for a while. We grew sweet corn and watermelons, and um, it was a very small farm. It didn't do super well, so eventually my dad uh, took a job at a local steel mill and had a variety of roles there. And my mom worked at the YWCA. She was the director of the YWCA. So I got to go over to YWCA all the time and hang out. And that was awesome because I just really enjoyed hanging out with um, all the girls who were there. And it just, it just, it was very nice. Is that where you started learning to swim? Um, yeah, well, I was always swimming, even when I was little. My grandparents had a place on a lake, and um, my parents liked to camp a lot, so I don't recall a time when I wasn't swimming, Um, but I I took to it quite well and swam competitively all the way through college, too, so, um, so anyway, so lived in Illinois, uh, moved a few times in Illinois as well, and then eventually moved to Indiana when I was in middle school. And that's when you taught a whole town to dance. <laughs> <laughs> and that's when, uh, <laughs> that's when, because uh, it was middle school, and uh, it was very difficult because, you know, I had known I was trans for quite a long time and learned the word when I was about 10. Okay. Um, read it in a book. There was a, a book called The Book of Lists, and it had this list of 10 renowned transsexuals is what it what the and list was the titled. good old days yes yeah and i was like oh and it really blew my mind that one there were famous people who felt this way and had done something about it and also um it just it was just that amazing moment that a lot of people have where i said i said oh there are other people like me and it, it was great but living in rural midwest I had no idea what to do about it. I went to the local library, looked in the 
card catalog because that's how old I am. Mm -hmm. And of course, there's nothing in the card catalog about trans stuff at all. So, and I wasn't about to ask the librarian. So, yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, at 10 years old, but you said you had known for a while, that's got to be quite a lot for a little kid to carry around with them, especially with nothing, nothing on television back then, nothing, not, nothing in society at large. Yeah, it was, really, <laughs> it was really strange, you know, because you couldn't even record television when I was younger. Um, I would read the TV guide voraciously to see if maybe there would be anything, because every now and then there would be something on television. Um, there was an episode of Real People, which was kind of an early show about interesting or unusual people, and they had a couple on there who were both trans, and that, I saw that when it aired, and I had to sit there very quietly and hope that nobody noticed how interested I was. Uh, but other than that, it was just pure luck. You know, maybe Dear Abby would have something in mm. the newspaper about it. But sure. But it's very rare to find information. Do you think your parents had an inkling? Well, I think, uh, you know, I was always quiet and creative and uh, was very interested in feminine things. You know, I played the flute and, you know, in rural Indiana, that was not the the, the wisest choice, perhaps. But, uh, you know, it's, it, it didn't, I didn't care what people thought, even back then. Uh, in some senses, but in other senses, I cared, cared very deeply. Yeah. Swimming. You became uh, the, the top tops, right? You were... I was pretty good. Um, so, yeah, I started swimming competitively um, when we moved to Indiana. You know, Indiana is a big swimming state. And uh, I had tried basketball, and I'm terrible with any game with a projectile, so that didn't go well. And Olympic spitting, not your sport? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I cannot do it. Um, and so I started swimming and uh, very quickly you know, realized I was pretty good at it. And it actually helped with the bullying, too, like being good at a sport kind of chilled people out on that stuff. Plus, I started playing the bass in marching band because we didn't have enough tubas at my rural high school. Yeah. And so I had a little electric bass and I'd march along with a little amplifier and, and play that. That's so cute. <laughs> <laughs> it's very ridiculous. I have some very funny pictures of that. Oh, it's so wonderful. Um, but yeah, so swimming was, was something that I could throw myself into. Um, I was pretty bored in school, so it just gave me something to, to focus on uh, and put my energy into. And it also is really good for self-discipline, I think. Yeah. You're super curious now. Were you like that as a kid? Were you a voracious reader? Did yeah. you go after knowledge? And Yeah. Yeah. Like, I read the encyclopedia and, you know, go to the library all the time. They knew me there and all that. So, yeah. So, yeah I was pretty nerdy. And then when computers first came out, I was... I had a science fair exhibit, and I saw my first computer, and even then I was like, oh, I'd heard about these, but I'd never seen one, and it really blew my mind. This is like 1978, maybe? Um, it was the size of a house, probably. <laughs> it, was, it was not very <laughs> fancy, but it was somebody had built it in their basement, and it actually did a few rudimentary things, and so that was... Like burn the house down? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> and so like that and the early video games like blew my mind. Like I was like, this technology is just astonishing. Yeah. Like and Pong, you know, what, I was like, wow, uh, Pong. Beep. Beep. <laughs> beep. <laughs> oh, the good old days. Yep. Uh, what did you want to study in college? So I was very good at writing from a very young age. Mm. I started uh, winning essay contests and writing things professionally in middle school and published my first book um, with some classmates on the history of a local military base um, in 1981, 82, something like that. Mm. And it was a bestseller in our county. Everybody wanted to read about the local history. Um, and so, so yeah, I... I went to college and studied Latin and Greek and English, and I was going to, I went to grad school after that. I was going to teach uh, probably like comparative literature or um, I liked 18th century satire and that kind of stuff. Um, 
but other than that, you know, I, I got to... Um, I got to to graduate school and I I was like I don't want to be around people like this the rest of my life because they were just a little too I don't know it, you know Flaubert said that uh, a critic is to an artist what a stool pigeon is to a soldier <laughs> and everybody I was working with is critics and mm -hmm. I consider myself an artist yeah so. Um, Plus all that corduroy. <laughs> right. Yeah, the clove cigarettes and turtlenecks. Yeah, it's just, it's big, not good. The big elbow patches. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Um, so I got out of that and started working in advertising. Um, I tried to get a job at a big agency through a contest they had, and um, they strung me along, and I didn't get it. So I ended up working at the Chicago Tribune for a few years uh, in the marketing department. And that was interesting because... I saw where newspapers were going, you know, this is 1991, and uh, it was already clear that subscriptions were starting to plummet, but they were trying to figure out how to deliver news electronically, and they had this thing called Digital Cities that they had partnered with AOL on, and um, my best friend from college, who's still one of my very best friends, went to work for AOL immediately out of college, so he's done quite well for himself. Yeah, I would imagine. Um, and uh, he, ha he, he has a yacht called Dot Calm, if that helps. That's great. Kind of love the yacht puns. Right. Nothing like a yacht pun. Um, but, you know, he and I both saw the technology was kind of going to be the thing, and when I first got online, I realized that this was the invention of our lifetime. And so, one of the first things I typed in was the word transsexual. And uh, this was on AOL, which closed at night at the time. It was, you know, so early. And AOL closed at night? Yeah. They'd come on and say, okay, we're going to close in a minute. <laughs> Be sure to shut everything down. Oh, my God. And, um... Can you imagine if the internet did that now? <laughs> right. Go to bed, everybody! Right. Might be, might be good, <laughs> I actually. I know, seriously. <laughs> um, but... You could get banned on AOL for typing, like creating a chat room with the, with the word transsexual in it. So um, a lot of people were starting to do activism around that. And um, some of those people were very influential in my transition and in my getting involved in online transgender activism. Did you get kicked out of some rooms? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they would come on, they, the moderators would say this is a violation of terms of service, and so you you would sort of, like now, you'd protect your main account and you might have alts and this and that to, to do other things on. It's interesting because, uh, you know, I've only known you for, what, a year and a half? I don't even know. Time is liquid, but... Uh, but you definitely strike me as a person who has a sense of what's coming next, which I don't think a lot of people have that sense. And it sounds like you've had that your whole life. Yeah, you know, I I think that I have a very clear sense because of, you know, studying the classics and studying, um, you know, English literature, like, of my place in history and kind of what the people that I respect and admired were living through in their times. And if you know that kind of stuff, then you kind of see what's going to be the big things in your time, you know. The writing on the, the wall. Yeah, the obvious things like the pandemic, you know, that's, sure. everybody knows this is going to be a historically significant thing. But um, by focusing on uh, technology, um, you know, I say follow the money. If you, if you look at where the money's going, that's usually a sign, you know, it's, uh, I, when I worked in advertising, my thing that I would always say is, you can always tell who's running a culture by who is the patron of the arts, and so if you live in a place dominated by the Catholic Church, the cathedrals are going to be amazing, and the art is going to be religious, and it's going to be beautiful, and it's going to be commissioned by people for whom that's very important. If you live in a corporate capitalist society that we do, commercials are the cultural glue that hold us all together. And um, and now it's F NFT art. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So now, you know, there's this interesting move to distribute that in a way that, that hasn't been before. So I don't know how that's going to shake out, but it's it's 
anything that decentralizes power is probably going to be an interesting you know, disruptor to the status quo. So those are always important to watch. What did you think of advertising, that world that you lived in? And you worked on huge campaigns. Yeah, you know, I worked at a big agency in Chicago that did a lot of packaged goods, which is, you know, pretty much anything you buy in a grocery store. So um, it's, it's a really good skill to have because you learn how to communicate memorably and effectively and quickly. Mm. So, Succinctly. Yeah, so I'm glad that I learned that dark art <laughs> because it's helped in a lot of the other stuff I do, especially the activism. Tell a couple of stories because you have great advertising stories. Are, are you allowed to, to tell Well, them? you know, it's so funny. A, a lot of the corporate stuff I do is so covered by NDAs that I can't oh, yeah. really talk about some of it. But, um, yeah, you know, I, most of the ads I did were for Anheuser-Busch, so Budweiser and Bud Light and... Um, also did a lot of cereal commercials and McDonald's commercials and just a lot of, you know, big all-American kind of brands, um, things that were on the Super Bowl and World Series, that kind of stuff. That must have felt strange as a person who was feeling once set removed. You're obviously excellent at advertising and what you were doing and, you know, a hero among your peers that way, but yet feeling separate from this all-American boy meets girl, meet, you know, meets hamburger, meets, right. you know, la lake, I don't know, whatever the hell that the American dream used to be versus what it is. But you, how did you feel while you were making these commercials while also trying to figure out who you were? Well, I went into advertising because I needed to make some money for transition. And I figured I, it's not difficult, it's not brain surgery, but it's there's a great line in Mad Men where he says, you're not artists, you solve problems. And that's absolutely right. You know, um, it feels like art, but it's, it's, it's art in the service of commerce. Yeah. And, um, and so it's a very narrow band of art. And it, there's, it's a craft more than art, I would say. Um, I don't know. I, I think I created a gender hell of my own making. Hmm. You know, I went to an all-male college, you know, trying to distance myself from my feelings about transition. I ended up writing these, you know, ultra-masculine kinds of commercials. And I was very good at all of it. You know, I was an all-American swimmer, you know. It's like all these things that I was trying to be because other people wanted me to be those things. Um, and then there just came a point where I couldn't do it anymore. Because yeah. it's not sustainable. It's not sustainable, no. What was the tipping point for you? I don't know if there was like a day or anything like that, but there came a point where um, I just, I knew that I couldn't continue presenting myself to people in my life because I was starting to get more and more toxic, I think. Mm -hmm. I was starting to, um, I don't know, close myself off from other people and sort of uh, starting to to be someone that I didn't like in ways that I hadn't before. You know, I didn't really like who I was. Like, I knew how to move through the world uh, to avoid getting the shit beat out of me. <laughs> and I sort of really internalized that from, you know, middle school times and said, you know, I'm not going to go through some of the things that I had to deal with at that time. And I think it just eventually reached its logical conclusion, which was something completely unsustainable. Yeah. Um, so... So yeah, there just came a point where I just I had to, I had to, you know, make the choice. And um, I think seeing people online who had done it really helped me. You know, there's kind of an internet bubble with all of this stuff. Where mm. when I was coming up, you know, our collected wisdom was an oral tradition. Like you, you went to the bad part of town of a big city and found some people who had transitioned and asked them what they did and who they went to and. That was kind of how it went for 40 years. And, um, you know, the Internet changed all of that. And that's, that's why I ended up writing what I wished someone would have handed me back in the library when I was 10. Mm -hmm. um, because I knew that all kinds of young people were going to find whatever I put up. Because this is before Google. You couldn't search for things very easily on the Internet. Um, 
So just having a, a what they call an information silo allowed uh, sort of a one-stop shop where whatever question you had about transition, I had the answer for it. Would you say that you had the answer for whether somebody was female to male or male to female transition? Well, yeah, that's a good distinction. At the time, I was really focused on trans women. It's kind of strange in our community that there's, uh, you know, I think we all get where we're coming from, and there's been more of a, a melding of shared interests. But I think at the time, you know, like, I think a lot of people are like, you know, who are trans guys are like, oh, why would you want to do that? And trans women are like, oh, why would you want to do that? And and so there's there's a part of it where it's like they're they're giving up the thing you want and we're giving up the thing they want. So it's like this this complicated relationship. That is fascinating. And uh, yeah, interesting. But now I think there's, you know, and my side I've really taken pains to be much more inclusive. You know, I was really writing um, kind of like a dress for success book for feminists in the 70s, you know, who were in the corporate world. So it was really for, you know, educated, white collar, super competitive, high earning people who I thought I was best equipped to help. My, my thinking was, if there's enough of those people who can transition on the job and not get fired, um, eventually they will have enough money mm. to support, you know, lobbyists and arts organizations and uh, political action committees and things like that. And that's what happened. Yeah, there's still a ways to go. Yeah, of course. Yeah, but much better now. Well, it's exciting because, you know, uh, gender rights are probably going to be the, the greatest civil rights movement of the first half of the century. And so it's kind of cool to be living through that and see where this is ultimately going to go. It's it's wild from watching, um, like for example, gay white men, for mm -hmm. example, where they are status now. Many of my uh, gay male friends who are, I would say, at the upper echelon of everything financially, status quo. They are, you know, running businesses, heads of things, politics, whatever. And I suppose that that's the beginning of showing that the rest is then to follow suit. And I imagine there's a hierarchy within the LGBTQ plus dominion where, you know, the boss, the bosses are right now the gay men, I guess. I mean, I don't know. Is, yeah. it, is that kind of the way it works? Yeah. I mean, in, in any affinity group, there's going to be subgroups that are doing better than others. And, you, you know, my feeling is always you're only as strong as the weakest link. Mm. In our case, it's children. Um, and figuring out ways to help the most vulnerable in our community is what I really try to focus on these days. Um, I had a lot of privilege, you know, I, I had pretty much every privilege. And um, I, I like to think that I did as much as I could to, um, to help all boats rise, you know. Yeah. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of people who, who feel that, that I'm part of the problem because I have not, um, you know, done enough or that I have, uh, you know, not been inclusive in certain ways. And, you know, I, I have certainly, you know, made mistakes in terms of, um, you know, in retrospect, how things are in a way that looking at a Dress for Success book from the 70s looks kind of silly and quaint now. It's like, in the context of what I was doing, um, Passing, for instance, was very important. Mm -hmm. It was like it's a matter of life or death. It was a matter of having a job or not having a job. So I very much focused on that as a matter of expediency. Explain to the listeners who might not know what sure. passing is. Sure. Um, so in the trans community, just as with uh, a number of things, including you know your your sexual orientation or your ethnicity, sometimes you can pass as a different group of people. And that means people, when they see you or interact with you, assume without your saying anything that you are part of a group that maybe you don't personally identify with. And so for, for trans and gender diverse people, um, that passing usually means being taken as a cis person who um, has always been... Born into it. Yeah, exactly. Or is it Maybelline? <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, 
<laughs> and so, so my focus on passing, which you know, in in context was, of course, very important. Now looks kind of quaint to the new generation because they didn't they didn't have to deal with that. So, yeah. so it's um, you know, part part of being an activist is that eventually your wave of whatever it is is going to be su- surpassed by the next wave. So, sure. second wave feminists, you know, get you know a lot of flack from third wave feminists and whatever the fourth wave is going to be the same thing and so so there's a new wave of gender activism some of whom see me as uh you know of the past antiquated yeah yeah and i get it and that's actually to me a sign of progress in a way that the fact that like there's log cabin republicans or conservative trans people you know, and a lot of people disagree with me on that, but to me, that's a sign that we have reached a certain point of acceptance. Caitlyn Jenner, perfect exactly. example. Yeah, you know, whatever you think about her, just historically, it's very important that there are people who can be conservative and accepted within conservative circles as who they are. Yeah, who would have thunk? <laughs> right. Seriously, who would have thunk? Right. And, you know, it. As much as I disagree with with a lot of what Caitlin has done, I completely understand where she's coming from because in a lot of ways, uh, I think there's parallel paths with what we did to avoid dealing with how we were feeling. Interesting. And there is certainly a level of bravery. I mean, she comes with extreme privilege as well, but there's a level of bravery to just be like, yeah, I don't fucking care what you think. <laughs> this is who I am, and, you know, yeah. this, so be it. Yeah, and there's not going to be people that old in the future who do this, you know. So yeah. it's one of the nice things about that internet bubble of trans people is that there was a huge wave of people, once they had the information they need, who transitioned. So now the age is dropping dramatically for when you come out as, as trans mm. or gender diverse in the way that it did with being gay. You know, it used to be you'd get married, have kids, you know, get divorced, then you'd, you know, maybe in your 30s or 40s, you'd come out as gay or lesbian. Right. So, Caitlin is sort of the last of a kind, you know, in terms of nobody's, one, nobody's ever probably going to be that famous who transitions uh, in America. Like, it's, she's just off the charts famous. And then, two... You know, people are coming out in high school and middle school now, so yeah. so that's great. But that raises a bunch of interesting issues yeah. as far as minors. Yeah, know. let's talk about that because yeah. you're going to have your opinion about it. What? Do you, how do you see that as a, a kid, let's say you at ten, wanting to at the very least talk to someone and have them understand where you're coming from? But you know, the proponents of that are saying yes. Let, let kids be who they are and support that. And then the opponents of that are like, are you insane? That's brainwashing. That's child abuse. So it's a very interesting argument. Yeah, you know, anytime there's kids involved in, in a political thing, it gets really heated because people have very strong opinions. And I understand that. Um, and I think in a case of trans youth, there's a big misperception that because most of anyone's transition, adult or child, is a social transition. There's really not a lot of uh, legal and medical things that, that you end up doing. It may seem like a lot to people on the outside, but most of it is just, you know, getting used to moving through the world in a way that you're expressing yourself that feels true to yourself. And so when people talk about someone uh, in, say, fourth grade who is um, saying that they're gender diverse and they want to wear dresses to school. It's like, that's great, I think. You know, I don't see any problem with that. Um, it's a social transition. People, I think people try out all kinds of different things, you know. I wanted of, to be Danny Kay when I was seven. <laughs> Desperately wanted to be Danny Kay. <laughs> right. Oh you know, God. a lot of girls are sort of tomboyish and, yeah. you know, they want to do this or that, things that are outside of gender. I think playing with those and finding your place in a gendered world is very important. And that when you suppress that and you, you try to treat that like it's a, a problem or a disease, even worse, 
then you're going to cause a lot of stigma and shame that manifests in all kinds of other unhealthy ways. So I think all kids should be able to be themselves without being shamed and without being uh, teased and all of that. Mm. Um, when it comes to making uh, you know more substantive changes like a legal name change or um, perhaps even something medical like blocking puberty, that's when people really freak out, even though that's a very small number of people of children we're talking about. Like most people, if they do a medical thing before they're 18, which is unusual, will just do puberty blockers, which they've been doing for, you know, since hormones were discovered in the early 20th century, they've been giving it to children who have precocious puberty, where they, they start to have puberty at like five or six, because there are social reasons why you don't want to go through puberty that young. Sure. So there are social reasons why a trans person should be offered the opportunity to wait to have puberty, especially if it's causing them a lot of anxiety or distress. Yeah. So, I mean, keeping your child alive is a great idea. Yeah. You know, the suicide if, rates among teenagers already is ridiculous. Yeah. You add that kind of stuff on top of it. Yeah, it's, it's tough to be trans and young. You know, it's tough for everybody to be young, but, but the trans aspect, especially right now, has become such a politically charged thing that um, it's, it's a lot of pressure for young people, and they feel that. And so, you know, I've proudly served on the board of a group called Trans Youth Family Allies that helped minors transition. And when I started doing that work, um, people's kids were being taken away from them for, you know, letting them express themselves. Like, there was a woman who was also on our board um, who wrote a book called Mom, I Need to Be a Girl. And this is in the early 90s. Her daughter um, got, you know, kicked out of a bunch of schools. She had to, like, do all kinds of crazy stuff. And she was on her own just trying to get the help for her daughter that she needed. And she's now flourished and is doing great as an adult. But it was very difficult back then, so I wanted to make it easier. Yeah. Wow. Did you get a lot of haters? Did you have? Uh, oh yeah. Yeah. Stalkers and things and. Yeah, you know, it's uh, that kind of stuff goes with the territory of of anybody's putting themselves out there in activism. Mm -hmm. um, you're gonna you're gonna have some people who uh, really want to present you in a in a very unflattering way, or they want to hurt you, or they want to scare you off, and I none of that stuff bothers me. Like. You know, I'm not... Yeah, you're a badass. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you, you can't care what people think about you. You know, RuPaul said, what other people think about me is none of my business. Yeah, and I say I, that all the time on the podcast. Yeah, yeah. it's really true, because if you're going to do this kind of work, you can't let that bother you. Mm. Any kind of work, for that matter. But I'm, I bet especially... Well, it's tough, because... Especially out here in, in L.A., you know, a lot of entertainers really want people to love them, you know. And, yeah. and they're, my friend Alex says, they're bottomless pits of need aching to be loved. <laughs> and so, so, for a lot of people, it's hard to be, you know, a, an artist and an activist. Yeah. How old were you when you started to make a transition? So I was uh, 26, I think, 27, something like that. And that's a physical. Were you already, were you already presenting as you are? Like, no, I'm a, I'm presenting as a male until I, I begin my journey. So way. I didn't come out at work until like a, a few days before I was ready to transition. Surprise! <laughs> yeah, because I thought I was going to get fired. Oh, like shit. I literally thought yeah. I was going to go in there and going to say, well. Bye bye. Yeah. Um, and luckily that didn't happen because uh, the the executive director of our um, creative department, uh, this guy named Bob, a lovely guy. Um, it was kind of like a that Tina Turner moment, you know, where um, where she goes to the hotel. It was like it was almost like that. Like I couldn't believe the the generosity of spirit. Mm. Ah, so. Yay. So, yeah. Um, oh, yeah, it's been uh, 
probably what like 30 years since that happened and it's still just like ooh. <laughs> it's a big deal I mean, it's a yeah. big deal it's a big deal to be seen for who we are yeah. and and for people to say guess what i love you no matter what there's nothing you can do to change that that's a monument to the human spirit right yeah yeah so um so when that went well then you know i transitioned immediately and um was everyone at work cool about it? No, no. Um, you know, luckily, it was coming from the top down that this was this is how it's going to go. So mm -hmm. there are some grumblings and grousings and this and that, and um, plenty of microaggressions and whatnot. But you know that that kind of stuff doesn't bother me. I don't, I don't care. You know, it's like I think I think once you've been uh, you know punched in the face a few times, it's like what 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 is somebody going to say to me that's going to really you know right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's very Gandhi-esque. <laughs> yeah. For sure. Um, so, yeah, you know, it, the, the nice thing, too, was that after I, um, after I uh, transitioned, it's very rare to sell a commercial. Like, you write a hundred commercials, maybe you sell one. And it's like I, songwriting. <laughs> yeah, right. Mm -hmm. And I sold 14 ads that first year after I transitioned. So, um, so my job security was quite set. I was feeling pretty good about things, um, and then I, I had some friends who had moved up from Nashville, and uh, they had a friend who uh, was dating this guy in the military, and uh, he was beaten to death by people in his own unit um, because the two of them were dating. She's trans. She was a showgirl in Nashville. Fuck. Um, and uh, so they they said, hey, she needs to get out of Nashville. She's going to come up for a little bit. Uh, so I met her. Her name is Calpurnia Adams. Lovely and, girl. No um, we hit it off really well, and she was looking to get out of Nashville for obvious reasons. Uh, and so she moved to Chicago, and we started hanging out more. And they were developing a film about this uh, murder of Barry Winchell, was his name. Um, just very salt of the earth, regular military guy, um, beaten to death, 4th of July weekend. Uh, and it was during Don't Ask, Don't Ask, Don't Tell, so uh, it was kind of a, a huge news story. It was on the front page of the New York Times. I was Times. Just saying, his name sounds familiar to me. Yeah, it was, it was sort of the beginning of the end of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. But, because that was really about sexual orientation, they, a lot of the press was kind of turning Calpurnia into... It was a gay relationship, and she was really a man kind of kind of coverage. And so I was thinking, you know, why am I selling hamburgers and beer when, you know, I have friends who are being raked through the coals like this by the media. You know, I know how this stuff works. Maybe I should start focusing on that more. And I had been doing the transition advice website for, you know, probably five or six years by that point, on top of five or six years before that, just sort of messing around on chat rooms and Usenet and stuff like that. Um, so she and I started talking. They were developing a film about um, about uh, Barry's murder and about their relationship. And um, it got into Sundance. And so we said, well, you know, let's... Maybe we should get into doing some media stuff. So we started shooting instructional videos on how to transition because it dovetailed into what I was doing. And we got to thinking about moving to L.A. And so we founded a company and moved to L.A. and um, have had a production company in L.A. for 20 years. Uh, what was the film called? About uh, the film is called Soldier's Girl, and it played on Showtime. And it's really, you know, one of the things that I like about art, especially film, I've always loved movies, um, is that movies are an empathy machine. You know, they they're a way of connecting people to other people in ways that they may not have expected that they could. Mm -hmm. And so, um, seeing something so terrible turned into this beautiful film. It was written by uh, my friend Ron, who you've met. Uh, ah, I loved Ron. Yeah, so... Yeah. Uh, who wrote Philadelphia? Mrs. Sofal. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so he's a very talented screenwriter, and to see someone of his caliber... Um, you know, get involved in this. And the director was Frank Pearson, who was the head of the Academy at the time. Mm. And he wrote unbelievable films. He wrote Cool Hand Luke and like oh, all man. kinds of just absolute classic films. 
And to see such talented people throw themselves into this, um, uh, you know, Troy Garrity played Barry, um, Lee Pace played Calpurnia, so it was very pedigreed uh, film, and it, it really they, they took care with it. Then they, they did. Yeah. They 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 had the respect necessary to do this, and they also. Um, did the work after the film, like you know the the media work that they did um, was also very respectful and enlightened, which at the time was not always the case. Yeah. When did you meet Dr. Osterhout? There you go, Osterhout. Yes, it's a it's a, a Dutch name. It means Eastwood. Which um, is interesting. Yeah. Um, Dr. Osterhout is considered the father of facial feminization surgery. So. Um, he is a very talented surgeon who um, did face work for me. And uh, when I first met him, it, he didn't have a website. He didn't have an email address. I literally wrote him a letter um, after doing some research because I'd had some really bad hair transplants. It looked horrible. It looked like this pencil eraser kind. And I was like, uh, this, is not, this is not good. I, I mean... I've got to, I've got to sort this out. And uh, so I wrote to somebody who I thought might know some information, and she gave me the names of two people. So I wrote to both of them. They both mailed me back a brochure. <laughs> like, uh, you know, nobody had websites. It was like a literal physical brochure of, oh, here's, here's what they offer. And um, in that brochure that Dr. Osterhout sent me, it mentioned that he had written a medical book called Cranio, uh, The Aesthetic Contouring of the Craniofacial Skeleton. And... I went to my alma mater's medical library because it was like, I don't know, $500, you know, it's like 25 medical years ago. Yeah, super very expensive. expensive. Yeah. And read it cover to cover and it was fascinating. Like, I had never thought about all the differences in people's faces and a couple of the, the cases presented were trans people. And so I was like, all right, done and done. This is the guy I'm going to. And um, so I was the first person to put before and after pictures on the web of my facial feminization. Mm -hmm. And that opened the floodgates for him. As soon as I did that, he was booked the rest of his career. He's, he has since retired. Yeah. But um, we, we not only you know, had a great uh, relationship in terms of patient and, and physician, but uh, we also became good friends because... He's hilarious, and he's quite the raconteur. Yeah. He's very smart. He's very, yeah, he's great. And um, so so we stayed in touch all these years, and whenever I get a chance to see him, he uh, he lives uh, in a lovely winery now, a vineyard. Uh, you probably. Now, yeah. <laughs> it should be called Andrea's Vineyard. But it's called <laughs> Andrea. Oh, well, anyway. <laughs> um, but, yeah, you know, it's one of the nice things about... Um, about consumer mm -hmm. activism, you know, I, people always say that I'm a transgender activist, and I always say no, I'm a consumer activist because I'm really only concerned about consumer issues. Like that's what I, like Ralph Nader to me is the mo is the greatest living American. Like he, he, if his name were on everything that he had improved through his activism, you couldn't you couldn't look around any place without seeing his name. Yeah, you know, then. The number of American lives that he saved oh my God. is off the chart. I, yeah, millions. Yeah, literally millions of people that he saved. Yeah. So, um, so I've always modeled myself after his work. And in fact, I was uh, I was represented by Public Citizen organization he founded uh, when I got sued by some scammers one time. So, so. Um, yeah, you know, consumer activism to me means if people have limited resources, you want to help them you know, get the most for their money. We live in a consumerist society, so it's very important that you give the power back to the people from the corporations. And so that's what I've always tried to do. Right, we'll be stepping into the firing squad after this right. conversation. What was it like waking up after, you know, you're all healed and you're looking at your true face, finally? Well, it's, it's when you first get facial feminization, it's a pretty intense surgery. Mm. You know, the way that Dr. Osterhout did it was 12 hours. So he would actually take a nap in the middle. So mm. you'd be still unconscious on the operating table and he'd go lie down and take a little nap. Yeah. Um, but 
when you wake up, you've got these drains hanging off your face and uh, a big bandage on your head. You look like a giant Q-tip and um, you're very swollen. So it's, you don't really see the result right away. You have a splint on your nose. Um, I have some pictures I can show you. It's like a big X of bandage across my face. It's, oh, yeah. I'm quite a mess. But um, once all that comes off, like you have some staples along your forehead, along your hairline, because um, what they do is they they uh, they burr down the the brow ridge it's called above your eyes because uh, people who have had testosterone uh, cause deposition of bone in their heads get big brow ridges right there usually um, and they also did what's called a genioplasty where they basically cut your chin into three slices and then they take out the middle slice and they put the little slice like the the butt on the bread and they stick that back up on there and it shortens the height of your chin and they're they're trying to make it so that it comes to one point instead of sort of two points at the bottom hmm. and they also took the flaring off the the corners of my jaw back under my ears just to kind of round that out a little bit and uh rhinoplasty which everybody kind of knows um and they know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and there's some other things that are available, but those are the things that I did. Yeah. So so to get back to your question, you don't really notice until later. Like, it takes about six months for everything to heal. One thing that happened right away is I remember I was shampooing, and the, the shampoo got in my eyes because they're used to the bone of my brow ridge acting like the eave of a roof almost, you know, and the water oh, would drip off. So, so there were little things like that that were, that were funny. Oh, that must have been delightful, though. Yeah, because it it completely changed the way that people responded to me. Like, I was not out at work yet. I had the surgery before I came out at work. And then I went back to work, and I, I was wearing a baseball cap because everybody in my office wore a baseball cap, so wore a baseball cap. So um, I was growing my hair out, but I could put it back and kind of tuck it into a baseball cap, and I kind of looked like everybody else. Yeah. But once I had this facial surgery, it was like even going back in the airport, like I was just getting mammed and, and you know left and right. Like nobody nobody was buying <laughs> this this uh, masculinity thing that I had been trying to do. Oh, it's so fascinating. One of the interesting things with facial feminization is um, I've really pushed as a consumer activist to get it covered by insurance. You mm. know, when I had to do it, it was all out of pocket. And it's starting to be covered under certain plans at certain large companies. A lot of tech companies, for instance, will now cover it because it's they want be so to expensive, I imagine. Yeah, I mean, when I did it, this is, you know, 1990, I had to do it in two parts because I didn't have all the money. Um, I did one in 1996 and the other part in 1997, so um, I think it was about $45,000 oh, all yeah. told in, you know, this is in the late 90s. As you were going through the hormone changes... Mm -hmm. I, I've I've listened to other interviews with uh, with trans folks that talk about how different they feel in their brain when the for example when testosterone leaves your body yeah. to the levels that they were coming you know and and replaced by estrogen how did that how did that happen for you how did it feel yeah you know I think for a lot of people in our community uh, uh, trans feminine people will call it testosterone poisoning mm -hmm. that it feels. It, it really does feel kind of toxic when it starts to happen in puberty, and it just, um, just, like, what, one of the things for me that was so revolting was the thought of being an old man was so, it's just, it was unbearable to me to, like, I love being an old lady, but being an old man to me was so anathema that I was just like, I just don't want that to happen. And there was some connection with that and just starting to head in a direction I didn't want to go in middle school. It was very stressful. And testosterone is, um, I don't know, it, it, I think that, you know, I was in a very testosterone-fueled world, you know, I went to this all-male college. You know, most of the people there were pretty bookish, but it was very sports-focused because there wasn't much social stuff to do. <laughs> and so you were either studying or you were working out. And um, then the beer stuff was kind of the same thing, you know. It was all just kind of 
very intense, you know. You're talking about advertising. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, So I was around people who had a lot of testosterone. (laughs) And I think, like, I don't want to excuse it. Like, I think that I was not as calm and not as kind of person. Like, I wasn't, I don't think I was volatile, but I definitely was, like, like, it was, I was quick to anger. I was, um, I don't know, I felt this kind of intensity to everything that, um, like, if I would get mad, I would, it would just, like, come on really fast. And once the testosterone was gone, that kind of went away. And the other thing that was really nice is that I don't think people who have not experienced it can understand how much testosterone makes you think about sex (laughs) like how much it forced like it's like just taking that away and sort of desexualizing my thinking I got so much clarity and was able to do so much more once that was out of my system like it just it just it was like a weight lifted to interesting to, to have this just like it was like I could suddenly see the world yeah in a way that that was open up to me that that wasn't before I once asked my dad, I was uh, at health, in health class, 7th grade, came home from school, and I said, Dad, is it true that men think about sex every seven seconds? And he said, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> <laughs> Which is a great answer. Right. You know? <laughs> yeah, that's good. Yeah, there's a comedian who said, if, if women knew how much men think about sex, they'd never stop slapping us. <laughs> Funny. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, one thing that's uh, that's interesting too is that um, you know that I haven't really talked about, and I'm being so serious in this interview is that you know comedy is a very important part of my life. Like when I was little, like I was the class clown. I would get in trouble all the time for making people laugh, and you know um, it's like on my report cards that you know I was I was I needed to tone that stuff down because I just I've always loved comedy, and I always I always find it pretty much everything to be funny you know I have, I have some limits but there's there, I'm unoffendable and I just think yeah I've been on road trips with you I know that that's true <laughs> yeah oh, <man. laughs> yeah so so you know here we are you know being really serious and I'm sort of giving you this sort of erudite interview but but yeah you know there's there's a lot of really funny things about tra- being trans you know that that never get talked about you know it's like um, like, there's trans-related jokes, you know, like, uh, somebody has uh, bottom surgery, and they say, doctor, you know, will I have to learn to pee all over? And I said, no, you'll just pee all over just anyway, because it's all swollen. <laughs> 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 so, so yeah, you know, I, I think it's important to find the funny angle in everything, and that's why I was really good at advertising, because a lot of the stuff I was doing is just dumb jokes. Having been in advertising, presenting male, and then being able to transition into your true self as female, but you have the knowledge of living in both worlds, that must have made you a superhuman when it comes to advertising. Well, you know, I, I've, I've joked before that my, my time before transition always feels a little like Jane Goodall, you know, <laughs> like... That I was observing, and I, I think they accepted me as their own, but yeah. uh, but I sort of felt a little outside of it. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, I th- I think trans people have certain insights and experiences that that can give you a different perspective if you let them. You know, some mm-hmm. people don't really grow from it either. You know, I don't want to romanticize being trans as like some we're not like magical creatures or anything, but but I do think that that Wait, it's... I don't get three wishes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you caught me. Now you get three wishes. <laughs> um, I think that um, having especially in my case done such gendered things, mm. you know, uh, both before and after, has been really interesting because I think that um, people people think there's this huge gulf, but it's really not that much difference. It's a pretty pretty big overlap, you know, and the things that people hold on to too tightly that, you know, there's these fundamental differences, I think... By the end of the century, that's really going to be changing significantly. You know, one of the one of the things that 
I believe, you know, we were talking about sort of where we are in terms of where we're heading. Um, you know, reproduction is going to be radically different at the end of this century. I don't know if you and I will be around to see it, but um, it's going to be uncoupled from physical pleasure. Um, and it's going to be what I call uh, distributed eugenics. Mm. So in the way that last century we harnessed the atom, this century we are harnessing the genome. And there's a bit of a race to make sure that societies see certain kinds of traits and behaviors as you know, value neutral. Because, as we know, when you live in a eugenic society, the, the, the traits that are deemed bad, um, they get wiped out, you know. And there's some canaries in the coal mine right now. It's like, you know, take um, trisomy, uh, was it 21, 23, uh, Down syndrome. You know, 90% of people who get screened for their fetus abort a, a child, a fetus with uh, Down syndrome. And so that raises a, a lot of interesting questions, you know, ethically and morally. And um, what does that mean if we can screen for being gay? Mm. You know, there are places where you can get an amniocentesis, and if it's a girl fetus, they will secretly abort it because boys are more valued in that culture. So we're going to see more and more of that kind of thing. and Especially as our overpopulation continues. Yeah, and they'll, they'll want to pick and choose Gattaca style. Yeah, yeah. You know, when we have the opportunity to flip, you know, A's and T's and G's and C's into w the opposite, you know, like a bank of of controls. Mm. Of course, people with the money who, to pay for that are going to switch all the intelligence ones on and turn off this and that. But the question is, which ones are they going to turn off? And that's. That's where the potential for real problems comes along. Because technology always outpaces morality. I doubt the truth. You really feel like that's within the next hundred years? Oh, yeah. You really do? Wow. That's depressing. <laughs> yeah. It's designer babies, as they're sometimes referred to. Well, as, it's already now. Right. Right. So, so there's going to be much more of that genetic counseling, you know, if you want to sort of whitewash it as a term. Where but, but they'll still need uh, the imprisoned race, right, the, the poor, which is what I call the, the worker bees to, to take care of the, although automation, AI right. might take care of that. Right. Like, there's, there's a bunch of possible futures. It's so dystopian. Yeah. Well, you know, I do a lot of work at this organization called Institute for the Future, which is a think tank in Palo Alto. And um, every time you say that name, I swear to God, there's a voice in my head that goes, Institute for the Future! <laughs> I do it every time in my head. It's so funny. <laughs> well, maybe I should start doing that then. <laughs> it <just makes> me, <laughs> I like laugh to myself. I'm like, Too. But, you know, the, the way to think about the future uh, is that it's not a set thing waiting to be discovered. Like, we're not moving towards an inevitable future unless you believe completely in fate versus free will. Mm. Um, I personally believe that we have some agency and I that there too. are probably multiple futures that could manifest depending on which set of variables happen. So the question becomes when things sound like they're dystopian, there's also a possibility for a utopian version or some, you know, probably more likely something down the middle. Um, maybe a mix of both. And in the case of um, distributed eugenics, what I could see happening is, yeah, there, there's a, probably going to be a class-related yeah. you know, thing where the people who can afford it are going to have you know, smarter and healthier babies, and the people who can't are not. Well, that's what happens now, though. Right? It's not really the future. Right, but it's yeah. going to be amplified yeah, yeah. in a way where, yeah. um, you know... There's going to be a, a class of people who can live to be 120, 130 years old mm -hmm. and still be in pretty good shape um, and be super intelligent and all of that. And so what happens to the people who uh, are not part of that revolution? 
you know, that's, that's where it gets to be scary. Um, and I don't have the answers, obviously, you know, but, you know, we all have to think about the fact that I believe this century the two big things are bioethics and privacy, that um, we are, we are heading towards a transhuman future, mm. and that, um, you know, trans people are the sort of uh, bioengineered harbinger of where that's going to happen. Like, you know, it's the, the alterations that we do are sort of a pale <laughs> preview of where things are going. Yeah, I had a, a guy on the show, Josh Smith, really fun conversation. He's an evangelical pastor, uh -huh. but he's also really into AI and what the future of AI is going to bring. And we talked about that it would be silly to think that we're not already, that many of us, I mean, it's not just transgender people that have altered their bodies to become something mm -hmm. that they feel they are. Women get breast implants, they, people get tattoos, we have heart monitors that, you know, keep our hearts, or heart valves keeping our hearts going. We have, you know, uh, bionic leg parts and arm parts for people that have prosthetic. We already are part robot. Yeah. You know, we already are part art project or whatever. Yeah, our I ear mean, piercings. I mean, when, I, I remember when my brother got his ears pierced, my dad, poof, he, he stared. Jeremy was about 21 or 22. And dad said, this is a quote, with every, we all memorized it. He said, self mutilation for the purposes of adornment is a characteristic of a savage people. And we wow. all looked around the room and we're like, so you're not into the earrings, I guess, <laughs> you know? Wow, that's quite a quote. It's, yeah, but how do, you forget a, how do you forget something like that, yeah. you know? Yeah, you know, I, I mean, we all, you know, a lot of people just injected mRNA into their bodies. That's you right. know, it's like... Happily. We, yeah. Like, we are heading towards all kinds of interesting things like, you know, human-machine interactions, you know, where we might be able to do like a Neuralink kind of thing, Elon mm. Musk's company. Yeah, he's all about um, it. You know, there's all kinds of ways that this could go. And that makes me nervous because of hacking, though, brain hacking. Right. You know, th that's... That isn't my own brain hacking. Yeah. So there's always going to be fits and starts with that. It's like, you know, with... Uh, we're heading towards self-driving vehicles. That's going to happen probably in our lifetimes. Um, but there's going to be a lot of problems along the way, you know. As there are already, yeah. Yeah, there's going to be people who die, and there's going to be, um, you know, other problems that emerge from that. But ultimately, it's probably going to end up saving lives, yeah. because most humans aren't very good drivers, it turns out. And if we can automate that in a way that's more controlled, um, then I think it's probably going to be better for everyone. Yeah. So, for you, for Andrea, yes. uh, where do you see your work heading? As we, Sorry about the airplanes. They're the, we're well, in a helicopter pad. Yeah. yeah. Um, there's a helicopter pad on the roof. I don't know if you knew oh, that. Wow. <laughs> you ready for a quick escape? Huh? Every time Elon hears his name, he just <laughs> shows up. <laughs> right. He's like, I, I, I just picked up something on the sensor. I need to get over there. That's right. Um, we just we shine a, a Tesla into the sky, and he just comes running. <laughs> what do you see as your future? Where are you heading in your work and your ideas and what you want to do? Well, it's really, it's weird for me because I didn't think I'd live this long, so I kind of feel like, uh, you know, I'm on borrowed time in a Do way. Do you feel that way because trans people tend to be murdered, or what did you... <laughs> yeah, I just, I, I always thought that I would be dead by 40 for whatever reason. Oh, wow. And I kind of lived like that for a long time. Like, mm. I was like, oh, you know, fuck it, I'm just gonna, gonna go for it. And uh, really, you know, burn the candle at both ends and lived a lot of life yeah. in that time. And I've kind of chilled out from that. I don't know, you know, I kind of feel like I'm starting my third act, and I don't know what that is. I don't know if I'm going to uh, continue doing film and television stuff. Um, I feel like... I feel like we're at this interesting moment with uh, the trans rights movement where um, we kind of hit a decadent phase in about 2014 where um, we got bloated and lazy and, you know... A lot of people had never seen, you know, bad times because they 
grew up under the Obama administration. It was just progress, progress, and all of a sudden there's this, you know, sudden backlash. And um, I think now people are finally, you know, starting to to galvanize and organize again the way that we used to back in the day, and really kind of present a unified front as much as possible. Mm. Um, there's a point where uh, things got kind of balkanized. I've always sort of seen that in all progressive movements have kind of, you know, gotten into a thing where they're they're eating themselves. And it's the same on, you know, the ultra-conservative sure. side, too. Um, yeah. But I think in my case, I don't know. I, I just... Uh, I. I really just like to catalog things. I like to to create interesting things. I'm working on this data visualization project to try to show bias in the media. It's it's turned out to be very challenging and very complicated. And I had two big things that that set that back. You know, one the pandemic, and two um, I had it set up someplace where I had to pull the whole project from because I just couldn't continue uh, working there. Mm. Mm-hmm. That happens. Yeah. And you've got films. You've got the, the creative arts thing yeah. happening. Yeah, you know, I, uh, I've i been very fortunate to work on a number of cool documentaries over the years and television shows. And we just um, got to see one that you... Yeah, remembered. yeah. We uh, we just went to the premiere of Whirly Bird. Excellent film. Which uh, originally uh, screened at Sundance in 2020 and then Pandemic, so... Um, we wanted to have a theatrical release, and that finally happened. So um, that was really great. Um, I have I just did a television series with this amazing uh, woman from our community named T.S. Madison. It's called the T.S. Madison Experience. Um, and you know, I was I was coming up through the corporate world, and she was coming up on the streets. You know, she's she's the real deal, and um, she's kind of the way that. Most people my age had to do it. And so I really have tons of respect for her and what she's been able to do uh, under the circumstances that she had to transition. Hmm. Um, and then, uh, you know, a couple other things going on, little projects here and there, but... Um, I don't know. We might dip our toes in a few things. Yeah, we've, I been, hope. we've been talking about doing some sort of stuff. You know, this this is a good start yeah. to finally do this thing we've been talking about where yeah. we, we sit down and have a conversation. Yes, yes. Um, but, yeah, you know, I still enjoy doing creative things. Um, but the the activism and the creative stuff that I've done so far doesn't come with a gold watch and a pension. Sure. And I'm getting to an age where I, I'm starting to, to think... Uh, maybe I should try to make some money again, like mm. I did with advertising. Yeah. yeah. See, I'm, I'm very lucky because I, a lot of artists, they start out cool and then they turn lame. But by starting in advertising, That's right. I sold my soul immediately, and now I've just been trying to buy it back this there whole time. There you go. It's funny because you say you feel like you're into your third act, and it seems to me like uh, wherever you begin your your life as truly you, that, that becomes your first act again. You get to hit a reset button. And honestly, you know so much about so many things that if you were to come out to me as AI, <laughs> I would be like, yeah, I'm totally tracked, so get it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, 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 I, I think what I love about being trans, and I actually have written about this in its thing called The Gift of Fearlessness, that once you have taken a leap of faith as big as making a gender transition, or even moving to Nashville and writing songs, you know, when, when you have done something like that and then succeeded, you kind of feel like, Oh, well, what else could I do? Yeah. And it's exciting. And most people have that, you know, shamed and tamped out of them in middle school and grade school. And it's it's a true crime. But we are very lucky that, that we were able to, you know, make it through those times and flourish and find our place in the world. And so... I feel like I have all these possibilities, and I don't know which which road I'm going to go down. The secret is to never show up to, to class in, in middle school and high school. <laughs> That's a secret. <laughs> I see. No, I was I was little Miss Goody Two Shoes, and yeah. uh, I I never missed class. But uh, 
but I was uh, drinking pretty heavily, so I, yeah. I almost got expelled for various shenanigans back then yeah. because I was self-medicating. For sure. And also Indiana. Yeah. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I love Indiana. My Hoosier friends, it's like, don't, don't, oh. don't, I'm not running down the state. Like I'm, no. very, I'm very glad to be from there because it actually helped me quite a bit yeah. in advertising because I know exactly what makes Middle America laugh. Yeah. And I have been able to use that to great effect in all kinds of situations. I've spent time in Indiana, and I very much enjoyed it. Uh, also, Bloomington is the coolest freaking city. Yeah, it's really great. I, I love grew Bloomington. up just north of there. So. Yeah, and it's if you're a bicycle person, bicycling Indiana is about the easiest thing you'll ever do. Mm -hmm. It's very flat. <laughs> it is so very flat. flat. It's <laughs> the best. I'm like, I'm going to go for a bike ride. I'll see you in four weeks. You know, <laughs> It's crazy. You can go anywhere. Um, Andrew, tell people how they might find you. Uh, so, my main website is andreajames.com. Uh, you can find me. I use the name Jokestress, which I've used since I got on AOL, actually. Um, I They they required you have a 10-character name, so I was like, well, I'm a lady joker. I should choose Jokestress. And so, th that has been my name on like Twitter and Instagram and you know, all the way back to Usenet. That's been my it's name. J O K E S. T, I'm going to screw this up, R-E-S-S. -S. Yes, so oh, yeah, joke right. and stress. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, and people think it's like, oh, is it a joke because you're stressed? It's like, no, it's like a lady joker. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you for this. What a pleasure such to finally pleasure. do this and, and to, to have such a lovely conversation. Thank you for listening. I feel like I was blabbing the no, whole time. No, I love time. it. I, I, I think it's great. I mean, I love talking with you. We do it all the time. So it was. I'm so happy that other people get to hear our conversation. And... Um, I feel like this is, talking with you, we could talk for hours about a million different things and go down so many different roads. And so her, perhaps you'll be on again and we'll talk about something completely different. Who knows? Yeah. yeah. We, you know, I'm always up for a conversation with someone uh, talented and interesting and funny and charming. And Yay. All that, so. We'll get them as well to come in. <laughs> <laughs> I just slapped her for those at home. <laughs> Thank you for listening, everybody. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Rate and review Hey Human on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks. Bye.